Certainly we thank God again for just the opportunity to be here and to be clothed and in our right minds. And when you consider how many people around us are being called home, so many are transitioning just this week again. A very good friend of mine of 40 years, uh, maybe not that long. Uh, you know, I'm throwing years around now as if I have been around. I'm ancient of days, but uh, it's been a long time that I've known uh, Brother James Womack uh, from New Jersey, uh, very close to Scott Julian and people that I came along with from years and years ago when I was in my early 20s. And so he is gone. Uh, his brother is, is now in the hospital because they were all together. And uh, again, it just speaks of how serious this uh, virus is and the variant this Delta variant is, is, is awful. So we're dealing with a lot of death. Uh, my brother uh, is, is slipping away on a day-to-day -day basis. We're still waiting for that miracle, praying that God will send that miracle. But that's just the way it is right now. And we're asking you to continue to pray for Brother Womack and his family. And then, of course, we're praying for Sister Lorna Carrington's family because her daughter passed yesterday and uh, now we're in a situation where we're just praying for every bereaved family for everyone who has been struggling through this very very unprecedented and serious times it's cataclysmic to say the very least so if you would bow your heads with me and pray for souls to be saved uh, pray for sister Sarita Jakes and others who have been out in the field working hard to do those things that God would uh, be pleased with and still have to face the difficulty of everyday living. Father, we come in the name of Jesus and we thank you because you have left us here to cry out to you for those who have been sick and those who are ailing. And we pray now, Lord, that you will move in a great way, that you will comfort in a great way. And as we've been dealing with the whole issue of comfort, we pray, God, that your comfort will be upon us and that you will make the difference where we can't go to the hospital, we can't travel to see a sick brother because of quarantine rules that are changing uh, every minute. We pray, God, that you will give the comfort, that you will be there, that we will do all that we can do from wherever we are, and we claim the victory now. Now lift our spirits, take us to a higher height. And give us that comfort in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So again, we're faced with the virus, with the vaccination. Uh, two evils. If, if you see the vaccination as an evil, and historically we have dealt with white supremacy, and we've been treated in a way that, of course, would cause us to have great doubt and to put much in our minds uh, to keep us from doing whatever the dominant culture tells us to do. But if we're looking at it from a statistical point of view and from a scientific point of view, if you've got two, you regard the vaccination as an evil, well, you got two evils. You got a vaccination that you're speculating about. We're not getting all the information you may say, but at the same time, we have a virus that we know is devastating our families, our friends, and it's happening worldwide, and now they're predicting that the kids are going to be in big trouble. So I don't see any other way to go than to go the way of comfort. Uh, the whole music department has changed. As you can see, things have been shifted around, uh, and, and, and necessarily so because of the time in which we're living and the kinds of things that we have to do, and maybe one day, we'll sit down and talk about the shift, the total shift, and, and to be in my position and to sit where I sit. I have to be able to recognize the shift. If, that, if I don't, then I'm not sitting in the right seat on the bus. If I'm sitting on the right seat on the bus and I'm behind the wheel, then I have to know which way the road is going in order for us to perpetuate the things of God and to continue ministry on the level that it must be continued on in these times. So we're in a shift. We, we're losing a demographic and we have to reach for another demographic. So things have shifted and greater shifts are yet to come. 
So I would like to meet with my uh, music ministry this Sunday. This Sunday. Last Sunday, I pulled a muscle and hurt my hip. Uh, I was pulling up on something like I was uh, 20 years old. I was 20 years old in my mind and 70 in my body. My mind and my body are 50 years apart. 50 years. Anyway, uh, but I've soaked and I've done all the things. I've got to do an MRI and make sure that I haven't ripped something apart. But anyway, uh, I want to meet with the music ministry Sunday at 12.15. Sunday, this is August 15, at 12.15, I want to meet with everybody because the only way to, for people to understand and to get an insight and to uh, interact with you is to do it in person. So right after church, I want to meet with the uh, total music department. And so pass the word along to everyone uh, that you know would want to be in that meeting at and so now uh, that's set, August 15, 12, 15, right after service. Continue to wash your hands. Continue to wear your masks. Uh, it's no time now to act like Hercules or as if you're indemnified from whatever's going on out there. Or whatever reason you use, you can spiritualize it if you choose. But at the end of the day, some real people are dying and people who are close to us are dying. And uh, you have to give God thanks that in all of your interactions, with all of your travel, with all of the meetings that you've had, with all of the relatives who've come to see you, with all of the church services that you've been to, the funerals that you've been to, you've got to give God thanks. The restaurants you've been to, whether on the rooftop or in the building, uh, you have to give God thanks. If you are not infected, you have to give God thanks and you have to ask him. What is my purpose? What is left for me to do? Uh, we're going into, uh, yeah, we're going right back to where we were. Uh, it's inexhaustible, actually. And so in, we were in John chapter 14, if you remember. And, uh, and I'll get my glasses and maybe do a little reading. And John 15, John uh, 16, rather. And... Uh, and there are many, many connecting uh, scriptures that we need to read and to touch on that would help us and strengthen us. And we're back to, uh, I haven't exhausted it yet. I, I have some questions to ask, and I haven't done that yet. And uh, I don't feel pressured to have to change at any time at this point. Uh, so uh, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me and my Father's house and many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, notice the significance now, where I am there ye may be also. And of course, whether I go, you know, the way you know. And I'm tickled all the time when I hear Thomas saying, uh, Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, uh, neither, uh, let's see, neither do we know, or rather, how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Here's another question. Lord, well, here's a statement uh, that indicates he didn't know. Lord, show us the Father. It sufficeth us, Jesus saith unto him, have I been so long with you, and yet hast thou not known me? Philip, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. How sayest thou then show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you I speak not of myself, but of course the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works 
that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Again, we, 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 we want to reiterate some things to bring those who have not been in the room uh, into the room. Of course, I, did, I spent a little time on the whole issue of dwelling and remaining. And I thought that was very important because it takes us away from our mundane material conceptualization of God in terms of dwelling and abiding. The dwelling and abiding place is the domain of God. I go to prepare a place is dealing with Calvary. You, you just have to be Christocentric in a way that you understand that we do not get revelatory uh, information about things that are simply mundane. Uh, we want to take all of the great spiritual uh, quotes and the great spiritual directions and directives and we do our best to make them so uh, mundane, so earthly, so physical and material instead of walking and moving in the spirit and understanding the spiritual aspect of the presentation of Jesus Christ. He is leading us away from the mundane, the earthly, into the heavenly and the terrestrial. And he's doing that while we're still right here on earth because very critical, we, uh, very critical to understanding is that we are dwelling in Christ Jesus right now. We are in heavenly places in Christ even though we're right here on earth. So when we talk about the Monai uh, in re reference to God's house and rooms as the... Uh, uh, the NIV version would be. Uh, when we talk about that, we're not talking about flats and apartments and buildings uh, and he goes to prepare, which means he's somewhere building something. You've got to remember that he spoke the whole earth into existence for those of us that are biblicists. He spoke the whole earth into existence in six days, rested on the seventh day. And of course, we understand that he, what, to go up there and build some houses in a celestial environment? Uh, he's not a contractor. I hope I made that very, very, very plain. So we are bound by space and time and the limitations of all of our thinking, but we must not limit the concept of God's domain to a three-story building or some dwelling place with a bunch of rooms. Uh, we've got to take it far beyond that. Uh, it got a little complicated when I quoted Bultman last week, and uh, it got a little, yeah, a little quizzy from an intellectual point of view. But the, the whole point that, that I was trying to make, and I hope I made it, is that the departure is on the cross, the death on the cross, the resurrection. That's the significant piece to all of us here. And that preparation of a place is via the cross, of course, and via resurrection. And that is the point I was making, no matter how difficult it got with Bultman and others who I quoted, that's where I wanted to go. We need to come out of the physical, material concept of God in our relationship. We need to move into that spiritual place where we understand the anthropomorphic expressions, anthropomorphic expressions that give an earthly picture of heavenly things. Uh, remember Jesus talking to Nicodemus again when he said to him, how can I tell you of earthly things, heavenly things? And you understand when I'm giving you earthly examples that you can't pick up. Uh, and so that's very important. Jesus virtually uses a Jewish type of oath. And again, I want to reemphasize, as I did to my ministers on Sunday prep, uh, remember that one of the glorious things that we have in grasping biblical truth and, il and in illuminating the Bible, one of the glorious things that we have is we have the linguistics of Hebrew and all of Aramaic and all of Greek as it relates to Jesus. 
which means then from an intellectual, from a cognitive point of view, comprehensive uh, point of view, he has given us enough language so that we can understand what exactly we need to know when it comes to illuminating the scriptures. That's what he's done. He's giving us enough words to dissect, to come up with enough etymological roots, to come up with enough basis for statements so that we can be accurate in anything and everything we say about God if we're exegetical in our approach. If I'm looking for the Bible to speak to me and I'm not just trying to put something in the scriptures, then there is enough language. Jesus has Hebrew in his repertoire as well as Greek and Aramaic. So he goes into the Old Testament here and he uses a Jewish type of oath when he says, if it were not so, I would have told you. Like God the Father, Jesus needed no one else to support his assertion of truth except to refer to himself. And this makes it even more immutable because whenever he speaks or he swears on himself, now you've got two immutable things. So now it becomes very important that he is including, John is including purpose the announcement concerning his purpose. So now an opening question here would give the impression that Jesus opened a debate. And, and yes, this is why we're going to have to deal with the questions we've got in front of us. We've got to deal with the questions because anytime you're being pushed by God in any circumstance or situation, you're going to end up with questions. And that's very important that we don't run from questioning the things that are happening around us. Because questioning shows one, as Paul Tillich would say, that we are dealing with ultimate concern. We have put everything else aside. We have slowed down our process on every side because something significant is resting upon our cranium. Something significant is happening in our minds and in our spirits. And this is what forces us into that place where we begin to question God. It's very critical that the questions are moved because of life experiences. And God does not mind us asking questions. And this is what he's leading the fellows in. So yes, he can always begin with a discourse, but then things end up in a debate or things end up in uh, not only a discourse, but it ends up where there's interaction, where we're dealing with him and he's dealing with us. This is why uh, Philip had said, uh, he said to Philip, uh, he that had seen me had seen the Father. And how sayest thou, show us the Father? Have I been so long with you and you don't know me yet? Now, I think in many instances, we as the preachers and teachers and the children of God, we in many instances or should in all instances represent God. I'm going to bring to you a very interesting text where the Greeks came and said to the disciples, we would see Jesus. We would see Jesus. And I think it's important because oftentimes those of us who are keepers of the gospel, those of us who represent the gospel, we oftentimes become blocks. We block people from having the kind of relationship with God that is important and necessary in the time in which we live, and particularly so. And so circumstances of life force us many times to reevaluate our presentation as the pandemic has done to bring us back into uh, you know charismatics like like this word bring us back into alignment because oftentimes we stray to the left or the right from the direct word of God and stay within 
what it is that we should and how we should operate. And so there are times when everything becomes insignificant because life has directed us down a path where one thing or two things or maybe three things at most become so significant to us that these are the things we bring to God and put before God for a series of time and seek him for the answers over a period of time, especially while the duration is going on. I, I think of David very quickly. I hope the illustration is apropos. Uh, David, for the seven days that he cried out to God to save the child who was a part of the great mistake of his life, and he cried out to God to spare the child. God said, I'm going to take the child away because you've caused the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. And there are certain things that are moved out of our lives that we never get back because we were not in alignment with God. And the fruit of that non-alignment had to be removed because it had caused blasphemy and it has caused the enemies of the Lord to speak against the things of God. Not the friends of the Lord, get that straight, but the enemies of the Lord. We got a lot of enemies of the Lord who are knocking everybody on Facebook and every other means that they can because they finally got a voice to be heard outside of a jurisprudence environment. They can just speak without any kind of license. And so a lot has been done in the church that has caused the enemies of the Lord. Now, I emphasize enemies because the friends of the Lord, love covers a multitude of faults. The friends of the Lord are trying to put the church on blast. The friends of the Lord are trying to minimize any damage that those of us who carry the word may cause because it does not help the cause of Christ for everybody to malign the people of God in their weakness, not in their wickedness, but in their weakness. And so it becomes critical to grasp the fact that the carriers of the gospel have many times caused the difficulty. And that's why when people come, they need to have less of you, less of me, and more of the Lord Jesus Christ because that is significant. How have I been so long with you and you have not known me, Philip? That is not Jesus' problem because as explicit and as open as he was to the disciples, there was something that obviously clouded them that they did not understand or see the spiritual aspect. Now part of that is because they did not receive the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, it's, it's a very critical piece here because the operation of God includes receiving and having the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And, and that is something that needs to be preached again as we preach Christ, as we preach salvation. We have to preach that you must be born again. And the ultimate concern in the middle of all of this death that's happening all around us is and should be, am I ready to meet the Lord? I see now why Bishop Jakes went on a three, four day revival uh, that we did many, many years ago when he first started. And he sees the significance of coming out of the pandemic into a revival environment because now we have to re-emphasize or emphasize, I don't know when I say re, I, it suggests that we did it once before, but we have to emphasize now more than ever the second coming, the parousia, the rapture, we have to emphasize in the middle of all of this death, in all of this unprecedented, uncertain uh, quandary and conundrum of a time, we have to emphasize the whole issue of salvation because that becomes another comfort. In the time in which we live now and the difficulty we have moving in this time, then 
the whole issue of resurrection, the whole issue of our resurrection, tied into the issues of the gospel resurrection, brings us back to the very substratum of why we're here and the very basis of why we're here, and that is the whole gospel message. So it is incumbent upon us now, if there's going to be an end time revival, to switch from the health, wealth, and prosperity, the make it good down here kind of a message, and bring us into that message that we got saved for. And that is that relationship with Christ that takes us from the ephemeral life that we have on earth into understanding that we are pilgrims passing through and the great significance of our relationship is one of eternity with him. This is why it's time for that revival message. And the carriers, those of us, me, I got to blame myself too, have not done the work so that the gospel and Jesus Christ is centered so now what we have done is we have left a group of people who are simply looking for a better life down here and questioning the presence of God when he wants to switch us from sight into faith, when he wants to switch us from the celestial, the terrestrial rather, into the celestial, from the ephemeral into the eternal. And we just can't make the jump. So this is why in verse 5, Thomas is saying to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going. So how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. You see, now he says to them, if you, Philip says, now Lord, show us the Father. And Jesus answered, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father's in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. It is coming from God. Believe me when I say I am in the Father and the Father's in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. So if you can't go by faith, he is saying to Philip, then you need to go by sight. Now, I had to go over this again, or I didn't really deal with this, because the section opens with a pithy statement concerning that the disciples know the way, and this is hold on. They know the way Jesus is going, which can be rendered literally, and where, which would be hupo, I am going, you know the way, who don't. So here again is an example of John, and, and when we talk about John's writing, we, call, we talk about Johannine, uh, Johannine, uh, the Johannine writing, the Pauline writings uh, we use, you know, in theology. But just to make it plain, here is an example of John shorthand that obviously moves some early copyists to expand the statement so that it would serve as a better introduction for Thomas's question. Where I am going, you know, and the way you know. An attempt at translating this expanded version to bring it into harmony with Thomas's question is what happens in the King James Version. But the later versions follow the shorter reading so that the strange redundancy is removed. Can I go over that? Now it's like I'm, I'm dealing with, with preachers. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And here we go. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. In 
if I am trying to be in, in you know, this is, you got to remember King James Version translation going into English. You got to understand the time in which it was written. Uh, I am moved in my writings to be to the point and not to be redundant. There are many words for that, pleonastic, copious. Uh, uh, to get to the point in preaching. And oftentimes, and I'm learning now that the presentation worldwide should be no more intense or no more cognitive than on a third grade level. Now, I don't know if I can ever get to that, but I'm doing my best to understand with the plethora of different nations that we're dealing with now, especially online and having interpreters around the world that I just can't come and act as if I'm a, ling a linguistic genius when I have to bring it down so people who are interpreting what I'm saying to other languages can get it. But understand this, you lose something in interpretation. So the writers at the King James Version have to set up in their presentation of Jesus speaking so that we can understand how it leads into Thomas's question. I will come again, receive you unto myself, where I, I am, there ye may be also. It's all about domain. If it's in a two-bedroom house, if it's in a spiritual environment, if it's in a cave, it's about you being with me. And I could give you that example later. Uh, I could give it to you now. And then, of course, the way you know and the way, whether I go, you know, and the way you know. So let's take away the strange redundancy and remove it. Despite the shorthand, take it away, the other versions have it short, the statement is clear. One writer reordering of the chapters, and, in, and McGregor did that, and in many instances the chapters of John were reordered, where they said he said this in the early chapter, which is something that he said later, and of course yeah, that's what they do in the universities, critical thinking as it relates to the Bible. But what McGregor does, he, he, attempts, he attempts to change this statement into a question, which further confuses the issue, and, uh, and we couldn't go along with it. When I studied him, I said, I can't, I can't agree. Thomas's question identifies him as what we would call the realist of the company. He is a fellow who always wants to deal with facts, which now brings us to a place where I can easily talk about, again, what is sight-oriented as it relates to dealing with God, what is I am scientific in my thinking, so I don't operate outside of any science. So you have to prove things to me from a sensual point of view, or I will not accept it. Now, we call this individual who operates around the parameters of the church, we call this person a realist. Let's be realistic. In many instances, the church has been accused of not being realistic or as our community would say, man, you're not just being real. I, I just need you to be real. Come on, bro, be real. The whole issue here of being realistic as opposed to being faith-oriented comes into question because as you can see in John 11 and 16, and, and, and maybe I should read that, and I do have a little time to do it. Uh, John 11, 16, let me run down there real quick. 11, 16, then Thomas, which is called Didymus, uh, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. That's 1116 when he was, of course, going up to Lazarus's place. Then if I run quickly to chapter 20 of John that you and I are quite familiar with, 
And if I hit chapter 20 and go down to 24, 25, uh, but Thomas, one of the 12 called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciple therefore said unto him, we have seen Jesus. But he said unto them, except I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger in the print of the nails and thrust my hand in his side, I will not believe. Well, notice then the significance of what we call realistic and faith oriented. You see, what the faith group does is understand a realism on the spirit side of things. Faith is not unreal and faith is not a lack of dealing with reality. What faith is saying is there is another side of life that is not sensually perceived, but revelatorily gained. And this is why without faith, it is impossible to please God. All of the realism that you can find and muster are all being real. Being real does not say that there is nothing on a spiritual plane, on a spiritual level. Because then you're going to suggest to me that all realists, and in being real, I can't be spiritual. I have to operate only within my sensual parameters, and anything outside of my senses does not exist. If that is where you stand, then you're going to be in a serious position because the just shall live by faith. And faith recognizes a realism that goes way further than the person who only operates in their senses. There is absolutely no way for you to receive this word of comfort and get to that place where you can overcome everything in your present environment there is no way for that to happen if you don't operate in faith. Because what faith says is it's more than what your sensual perception is all about. So Thomas's question makes him, and as we see throughout his life in re reference to the other disciples in Jesus, he was that part of the group that if he is convinced, then everybody else is going to operate in being convinced. But the point is, what Jesus is saying to them now is there is something that you have to receive from me in my absence that now calls for you in the realism of my presence through your sensual perception is now going to shift to the realism of my presence through your faith. This is why I've been saying to those of us who will listen that he is the God of the natural and the supernatural. And many times when he commands things in the natural healing and he commands things moving and calming the water and, and, and all of that, I have always asked my question, I asked this question, did Jesus calm the storm out of being supernatural or did he calm the storm out of being natural? Meditate on that. God gave us dominion over everything in the earth before sin. So wouldn't we have the power in a natural environment to be the commanding force in the earth according to the decree of God giving us dominion. The problem with the world 
is not outside of the hands of man. But man has got to understand that when he was created, God came to visit him in the cool of the evening to give him a revelatory experience of things that are in the spirit. I put you on earth, but there is a part of you that I blew into you, which is the breath of life. So in all of you being realistic, Thomas, you've got to understand there's another side to realism, and that's the side of faith that introduces the domain of God in a spiritual matrix. So your senses don't operate in the realistic aspect of the Holy Spirit and the realistic aspect of the domain of God. It's not less real. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Because it's not seen doesn't mean it's not real. So question that Thomas asked identified him as having a certain mindset. And once that mindset is in place, you can't receive comfort. Because you're only going by your sight. And you're not looking into the terrestrial, into the heavenlies, into the promises that God makes us that are beyond this life. We are now being called upon in the middle of all of this death to receive the promise of life beyond death or life on the other side of what we're living now. Now we've got to understand more than anything, we're only pilgrims passing through. Yes. Seven years I've been on earth and it's going fast. Today is Wednesday, Sunday be around in no time. And it's going fast and I'm not traveling. When I'm traveling and having schedules catching planes, I mean it is moving. It's August already. So anybody who has any wisdom and any fear of the Lord, reverence that is, not petrified, but reverence, reverential fear, understands the whole issue of teaching uh, of, of teach me to number my days teach me to understand that this earth is not my home and so this is what brings comfort when he spoke to the Thessalonian church what Paul did was he told them what brings comfort and that is the dead in Christ shall rise we that are remained shall be caught up to meet them in the air so that means there is something else then he turns around and says, comfort one another with these words. The comforter comes to lead and guide into all truth, to take us to that place where we understand that truth is not only on a realistic side of, of a mathematician's uh, count, but it's also on the side of what you can't count. And that is where God dwells in the abundance of spiritual power. And this power he's given to you and I who are earthen vessels so that the victory that we have and achieve is not of us but of God. And he does it in this passage when Jesus says to them, you don't know me but I've been this long with you. Everything I'm doing is what the Father is doing in me. I'm speaking his words. I have in him, in me. Theology, Christology. But then I'm going to put me in you, Christology to pneumatology. So that in the same way I extol the virtue and I did the will of him that sent me. Then I expect you to do the will of him that sent you, who is me. So he's leading us through what it is he, as our master, as our Lord, how he operates through the infilling and indwelling, rather, of the Father in him. And he's operating out of the, the, the juices that are given to him through the power of the Father in him. So I'm not doing myself here. I'm doing him. So when you look at me physically, you see the corporality, you see the physicality. But I'm doing him. And that's where we're expected. We're expected to do him. And this is the comfort. The only comfort you can get out of life is knowing you're doing him. When everybody's against you, when demonic powers rise up against you, 
when enemies come from within your own camp, within your own family, within your own church, within your own choir, within your own ministerial alliance, within your own contemporary brothers and sisters, when it comes within, whenever there's an attack, the only comfort that you will have in that is that you're doing him. I'm doing Jesus Christ. I'm operating within the parameters of what he called me to do. And that's my comfort. This is why the Hebrew boys could stand and their comfort was. He, the God we serve, he's able. And he will deliver us out of your hand. But here is what we're standing on. We're standing on and if not, we're still not going to bow. And that's our stand. That's our place. That's how we handle things. So I don't want you to see uh, Thomas merely as a doubter. I want you to see him as what we call a realist. And, and, and expand your realism to, to realize. Uh, that's a little redundant. Realism to realize. Expand your realism to a spiritual environment that now operates by faith. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me. You've never seen your Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah uh, Maccabees, Jehovah Rofa, Jehovah Rofika, Jehovah Shalom, uh, Jehovah Nisi. You, you haven't seen him. But you believed him and he demonstrated his power through the circumstances you faced. So the fact that you and I are still alive for the purpose of God to do him when others have been called home is indicative of his operation. I don't see him with my eyes, but I sense him in my spirit. And what I see that's happening is as a result of him operating. I don't see him doing it. I don't see him watering the grass, but the grass is green. I don't see him preparing the meal, but the table is spread. That's the whole point. The point is the results are indicative of the fact that God is operating. The fact that with everything I'm going through, my stress level is going down on everything is indicative of the fact that God is operating. If he wasn't operating, I wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be here. The world would have been swept by this disease and its variants. And this virus is taking on every kind of form because it doesn't want to get out of here. It wants to keep living. So it's going to hop to every single body that is capable of receiving it. And that's what a demon does. It's like it's demonic, it seems. Because that's what demons do. Demons go into every place that they can find access to so they don't have to go back to the lake where they belong. And wherever this thing came from, it needs to go back. So from a natural point of view, we indemnify ourselves. From a spiritual point of view, we understand that getting through here is evidential of God's operation. And we also understand the realignment to the things that are significant for salvation. And why am I saved? To, to live in his domain. So in response, and I've got two minutes or so, uh, Thomas splits the goal as destination. Where? From the route or the way. Now we go again. I'm going to pick up from here because I can't end this without dealing with the interaction between Thomas and the Lord because this is going to introduce something that we, we, we want to stay with. Thomas wanted a road map, but he did not know how to get one if he did not know where he was to end the trip. I, I need a road map. But in order to have the road map, I need to know where. 
So what is its problem? Thomas's problem was that in the metaphor of the house and the rooms, Jesus had told him the destination. I go to prepare a place. I go to the domain. But Thomas misinterpreted the metaphor to be a statement of taking a journey. I'm telling you destination. Thomas is saying, well, I need to know how to get there. I need a roadmap. What Jesus was talking about, and this is why I, I, I insisted on trying to tell you, you got to get away from all of this health, wealth, and prosperity stuff and materialism when you start dealing with Jesus. Jesus was talking about the ultimate relationship of life that humans have with God and that has implications for our eternal destiny. When one understands a metaphor from this perspective, the way then becomes more akin to a way of life. I am the way. Everything I do and the way I live is the way you live to get to the destination of eternal life with God. So when you talk about destiny, my brother, my sister, what is the ultimate destination for you? A 40-room mansion, Rolls Royce, a Koenigsegg, a Varan, Bugatti, designer clothes, private jet, yacht. What, what is the destination of life for you? And the, the bottom line is all of this moving into the spirit and, and, and came unto his own, gave them power to become the sons of God. All of that is for an eternal destination. So some go before us, some come after us, but all of us are going that way. So that is the comfort. The comfort is the way then becomes a way of life. So I'm already in heavenly places. So somebody says, well, did your mother go to heaven? My mother was in heaven while she was here because she was with him, a way of life. This is where we are, and once that becomes the focal point for each one of us, then we will know the way, because the way is the way of Jesus. Everything that he represents and every way that he functions and moves and all of the operation of God that's in him with kindness and gentleness and peace and love and long-suffering. Oh, yes. Yes, and, and please don't leave uh, uh, the one out that, that deals with discretion. Of course. That's all a part of Jesus. Moderate, loving, kind, gentle, long-suffering, patient. All of that, fruit of the Spirit, way. I am the way. And so it becomes akin to a way of life. I know y'all, your time is up, and that's where I'm going to pick up. Uh, and, and here's where I'm going to start. The concept of a way of life is foundational, not only to the proclamation of Jesus, Paul, and John, but it was also a way of life to Israel and to the teachings of the rabbis. You see, the Hebrew word, Halak, walk, provides the insight. And that's where I'm going to pick up next time. I'm not going to let this go. If it's even, it's, if it's even uh, selfish for me because I'm seeking the comfort. And, and I'm finding it. I got it. I got it, Lord. I got it. And that's where we're going to go 
the next time. Father, I thank you for this session, this time. And I hope as we indulge further into this very powerful passage that souls will be brought to light and salvation will come and the realignment will take place. Oh, what a way to realign us. It's so, so cataclysmic, so disturbing. But we thank you for it. Bless us now. Console the families. Touch my brother now. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you need salvation, and I tell you, if you're not born again, now is the time. Now is the time. Now is the time. I have earthquake insurance for the place I live. And uh, I don't know if I'll ever have an earthquake. Uh, according to the science, it's coming. But I have earthquake insurance. I can't wait until I have an earthquake to go get the insurance while the house is damaged. Because they're not gonna, they're not gonna fix it. Say so you, you didn't have any insurance. Well, I, I didn't think I needed then, but I need it now. So give me some insurance right now. If, if there's ever a time that we need to get insurance out for burial, now is the time. You can't get insurance to be buried after you die. There's certain insurance you can't get if you're sick. When you're sick. You get the insurance before you get sick. When you get sick, you just can't run out and get some Blue Cross Blue Shield now that you got some terminal illness or something on you. You get your insurance before anything comes down the pipe. You simply do it out of wisdom, anticipating changes in life. And that's just sensible. You put your will in order. You put things in order because death is inevitable. Death and taxes. You do that before it comes down. I say it all that simply to say to you, you can't seek salvation after you're dead. Now is the time. Hear my voice, harden not your heart. And He's calling you now, backslider, he's calling you back home. Sinner, he's calling you to salvation. I know the word has been mishandled in churches, but you can't focus on that now. What you got to focus on is your soul and being saved. You can decide what church to go to later. Right now, I just need you to focus on being saved. Get that insurance so that if it's a car accident an airplane crash if it's covid whatever it is that takes you out of here you're already covered i wish somebody would say that i'm covered i'm covered and this is the comfort the comfort a hundred years from now none of this is going to matter to any one of us that's living so it's inevitable and when you feel that you've done others wrong and you have hurt others, hurt yourself, walked outside of the will of God, now is the time to come. And I need you to call 844-267-7729. 844-267-7729. Father, I pray for those who are reaching out to us now bring salvation into their life, fix everything according to eternal destiny, and we claim it in Jesus' name. What a cataclysmic to bring us into alignment, this pandemic and all that it's done. 600, close to 700,000 Americans dead, not to mention around the world, to bring us into the alignment that this world is not our home. It's not our home. Email us, prayer at cityofrefugela.org. Reach for us there. We thank God for your time. Glad again for your offerings and for just being so faithful. I thank God for all of you, children of God, members of the city who have been faithful 
to those of you around the world who have been faithful. We thank God for you. I've been told that I shouldn't just do the YouTube people, so I'm shouting out to everybody on every media platform. But I'm bringing you and calling you to YouTube because when you come to YouTube, it helps to facilitate what we do and it helps to be a greater blessing around the world. So I'm inviting everybody, share with everybody, jump on YouTube, get on YouTube. The bigger the numbers on YouTube, the better the responses we have, and, uh, and that's important. And then, of course, get the app. You must get the app. And uh, we need to build up our subscribers. We need to talk to more people. Uh, Bishop Jakes told me I should have got in this race a long time ago. Uh, we're at 66 point two uh, K subscribers I think he's at a million I tell him all the time when I see him and see his numbers I get envious uh, but I have to repent because he told me do this a long time ago uh, so please I'm, I'm shouting out to a few people here on uh, YouTube I'm saying to everybody else in every other media I love you I love you and thank you for being with us but jump on YouTube so I can see your name because that's where I will be. Uh, uh, Renee says, I'm on YouTube too. Okay, so uh, that's wonderful. I think that the church and all of us now should, our fight right now for where we're going and to understand where we're going, and we still have a few people on, so on this media, uh, understand where we're going. If you're dealing with me at my age in church and you're catering everything about church for me, you're dealing with a diminishing demographic. I'm passing through here. If church is going to be viable and church is going to grow, it's got to reach younger people. It's got to reach young people. So church has to take on the flavor that is adoptable and is attractive to the people who are going to be the future. I'm a diminishing demographic. My, my deacons are diminishing, uh, diminishing demographic. We can't cater to my deacons. You can't cater to me. I have to cater now to the church of tomorrow. So if things look a little different in the sanctuary, if the music is a little different, if the presentation is a little different, it's because we're trying to reach connectors. So I'm saying to those of us who have enjoyed 40, 50 years of gathering and enjoyed 40, 50 years without lights flashing everywhere, 40, 50 years with a choir stand that, is no, that we regarded as normal, with choir members sitting there, many of them sleeping while the camera's on them when you're preaching. Now we've moved all of that, and we've made it some big, exciting kind of a, a disco kind of a presentation. Well, that's just what it is. So be wide enough to understand that our intent is to be all things to all men, that we may win some to Christ. Let's not get caught up with the rigors of the presentation, but let's get stuck on the message, because that's really what makes the difference. I just got to fix it so that they get it. You listen to the Steve Harvey show in the morning, all the jokes, but in the middle of all those jokes, he's giving information. And so we've got to understand that our culture is a culture that leans towards entertainment, leads towards what's flashy, leads towards what gets their attention. And Jesus got their attention in different ways. Sit 5,000 people down and feed them and keep breaking that stuff. You got my attention. But at the end of the day, they didn't serve him for that. They ended up, he ended up saying they came for the meat and the loaves. And that's what's happening today because we teach a meat and loaves salvation instead of the eternal destination which is to be with him and he has brought us now back into alignment 
That's why the revival message was to fill folk with the Holy Spirit and get them saved. That's where we are now. So uh, let me holler at a few people here. Uh, well, I, I see my same, same old friends. I've got Tanya, we've got Vanessa, we've got Perla, we've got Carol, we've got Dr. Khan, Johnson. Yeah, Khan, you're a doctor now. Fantastic. We've got Denise Malcolm. We've got Fokuo Bright. We've got Kenneth Speech. Yes, we've got Vivian Collins. We've got Perla Castro, I called her already. Uh, Lisa Williams earlier. We had Peculiar Person. We've got Gourmet Coffee Beans. I love it. We've got uh, Trice, I think it's Trice uh, Roll. We've got Gail. I don't know where all you people are from. Are, are you local or all around the world? I see names. Uh, Elm, Jackson, Cindy Maxwell, Extraordinary Ordinary. Fantastic. And uh, we've got Karen L. Uh, Northwest or NW. We've got Sharon, we've got Ruby uh, Jones, we've got Harpazo Ministries. Listen, we need to be covered, and that's the important thing right now for all of us to be covered. And to you who are on all the medias, God bless you. Remember, send your twenty dollars in with your tithe if you can, and continue to be a blessing to the City of Refuge. We've got some great things coming. We've got some monster moves to make to get us aligned for what the future of the church is. Stay healthy. Be wise. Stay healthy. Do what they're asking us to do in the natural, and then if that doesn't cover us, now we can look to God for a miracle. God bless you. I love you. I will see you Sunday, God's willing, if I got to walk with a cane but I've been soaking and working on healing, and I thank God for that. So pray for me, pray for my brother. Uh, unless the miracle comes, he's slipping away daily. So give God glory and give God praise for your life, and let's stay together. God bless.